thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a week ago, on the 78th Independence Day, the Internet Freedom Foundation celebrated its eighth birthday. And we're deeply grateful to our incredible IFF community. Some of you have only recently joined us, while others have been with us since day zero. Um, and as IFF has been community-led, run project since day one, the support of our donors, members, and community across channel has been instrumental in driving all our efforts. In a world where all avenues and spaces of civic advocacy and dissent are shrinking, it is when we think of this community, you guys, and feel a sense of relief. Uh, the fight for our liberties and the fight for our right, rights respecting society seems doable. We can get there. This year, we mark the seventh anniversary of the Supreme Court of India's historic Puttuswami judgment. Uh, this edition of Privacy Supreme forges ahead with a new format to facilitate conversations on diverse and pertinent themes that will touch upon contemporary debates on the role of digital technologies, personal data, and the state of our democracy. Now, I would like to kickstart the evening by inviting IFF's Executive Director, Pradeek Vagre, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Mulidhar, former Chief Justice of the Odisha High Court. Pradeek, please. Can everyone hear me? OK, great. Uh, thanks, Purvai, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I will keep this short, because I know you're not here to listen to me. Uh, so uh, again, it is, it is today, this evening, uh, my distinct privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, he's a true luminary in the Indian legal system, and uh, you know his il illustrious career, both as a member of the bar and the bench, uh, has been characterized by an unwavering dedication to justice, a profound commitment to equality, uh, and a steadfast defense of human rights. Uh, and his legacy is a testament to the power of law as a transformational tool uh, for social change. Uh, Dr. Mulidhar has left an indelible mark on Indian jurisprudence through uh, some groundbreaking rulings that some of us in the room are, I'm sure, familiar with. Uh, the notable ones such as the landmark Nas Foundation case of 2009, where he, alongside uh, Chief Justice A.P. Shah, struck down Section 377 of the uh, IPC. Uh, the, the historic judgment affirmed uh, that the rights to dignity and privacy are essential to, to life and liberty. Uh, additionally, uh, is ruling on uh, forceful eviction of slum, slum dwellers in Delhi highlighted the, the right to city, recognizing the critical role of slum dwellers uh, in, the urban, in the urban fabric and upheld their right to housing and essential services, uh, something I'm sure all of us uh, you know, feel, feel strongly about. So today, uh, we have the extraordinary opportunity to hear from someone who's not only upheld the rule of law, but has actively shaped it into a force of social transformation. Uh, and as you know, as we reflect on uh, seven years of the Puttaswami judgment, uh, I'm sure his insights promise to challenge, inspire, inspire us, and to illuminate our thinking. Dr. Muridhar, please. Thank you, Pratik. Good evening. Seven years ago, on 24th August 2017, nine judges of the Supreme Court of India declared that the right to privacy is protected as an intrinsic part of the right to life and personal liberty under Article 21 and as part of the freedoms guaranteed by Part 3 of the Constitution. The genesis of the above declaration was a batch of writ petitions filed in 2012 in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutional validity of the unique identity Aadhaar project and the January 2009 notification of the central government by which the UADAI, the Unique Identification Authority of India, was set up. Under an executive notification, the government began to collect fingerprints and iris scans of individuals. It had no statutory backing. Among several grounds, the petitioners contended that such collection of personal biometric details on a mass scale without prior informed consent violated the right to privacy. Appearing for the central government, the then Attorney General claimed that Indians had no fundamental right to privacy. He contended that the judgments in Gobind in 1975, in Rajagopal in 1994, in the PUCL case in 1997, that recognized such a right to privacy were contrary to two rulings, one of an eight-judge bench in MP Sharma in 1954 and another of a six-judge bench 
in Kharak Singh in 1964. Realizing that these decisions would have to be revisited, a three-judge bench on 11th August 2015 referred the issue to a larger bench. Two years later, the nine-judge bench, speaking polyvocally through six judges, delivered the landmark privacy judgment, K.S. Puttaswamy versus Union of India. Nine privacy types were merited recognition, among which were communicational privacy, which enabled an individual to restrict access to communications or control the use of information communicated to third parties, and informational privacy, which enabled an individual to prevent information about oneself being disseminated and to control the excess extent of access to such information. The court held that the right to privacy was not absolute, but emphasized that the privacy is not lost or surrendered because an individual is in a public place. Privacy attaches to the person since this is an essential aspect of dignity of the human being. Meanwhile, the Lok Sabha passed the other targeted delivery of financial and other subsidies, benefits and services act of 2016 as a money bill. The Rajya Sabha, which had expressed reservations about some of its provisions, was bypassed. Soon thereafter, the hearing of the batch of petitions challenging the Aadhaar Act resumed before a five-judge bench. Section 7 of the Act mandated that individuals must provide proof of their Aadhaar numbers or undergo Aadhaar-based authentication to receive subsidies, benefits, or services. Section 57 of the Act permitted private entities to commercially exploit personal data of individuals without their consent. Section 139AA of the Income Tax Act mandated linking of PAN with Aadhaar. The validity of all these provisions was questioned. Also challenged were rules and circulars that permitted collection of biometrics of children, that mandated the linking of mobile numbers and bank accounts with Aadhaar. Also on board were contempt petitions arising out of the wanton disobedience by the government of the interim orders in which the court had insisted that Aadhaar should not be made mandatory while it was still seized of the petitions. This was the first major occasion when the law and principles enunciated in the privacy judgment would be put to test. The Supreme Court quite spectacularly failed that test. On 26 September 2018, by a majority of four to one, the Supreme Court substantially upheld the validity of the Aadhaar Act, held that it did not violate the right to privacy, condoned the brazen violations of its interim orders by the central and state governments. It was not a mere coincidence that none of the four judges who constituted the majority in the Aadhaar judgment were part of the nine judge bench that delivered the privacy judgment. The lone dissenting judge who held the Aadhaar Act and the Aadhaar Project to be unconstitutional was a member of the privacy judgment. A reading of the majority judgment and of the dissent reveals diametrically opposite approaches. The majority accepted the government's plea that the Aadhaar Act could be passed as a money bill, whereas the dissent held it unconstitutional on that very ground since it did not satisfy the basic requirement of a money bill under Article 110 of the Constitution. Consequently, while the majority held Section 139 AA of the Income Tax Act mandating the linking of Aadhaar with PAN to be valid, the de dissent held it was not. As regards Section 7 of the Act, which made possession of a UID number as a precondition to availing social welfare benefits and services, the majority saw it as an issue of balancing of two competing fundamental rights, the right to privacy on the one hand and the right to food, shelter and employment on the other. The majority held that enrollment in the Aadhaar scheme actually amounts to empowering these persons. The scheme ensures dignity to such individuals. The dissenting judge saw it differently. He held that the inclusion of services and benefits in Section 7 is a precursor to the kind of function creep which is inconsistent with privacy and informational self-determination. The broad definitions of the expressions services and benefits would enable government to regulate almost every facet of its engagement with citizens under the Aadhaar platform. The dissenting judge asked, should the scholarship of a girl child or a midday meal for the young be made to depend on the uncertainties of biometric matches? He answered, and I quote, our quest for technology should not be oblivious to the country's real problems, social exclu exclusion, impoverishment, and marginalization. Overlooking the UIDAI's own commissioned studies, 
which spoke of considerable failure rates in authentication. The majority glibly accepted UIDIA's unverified claim in a PowerPoint presentation of 99.76% accuracy of the biometric data. Applying the utilitarian logic, the majority asked, if the Aadhaar project is shelved, 99.76% beneficiaries, beneficiaries are going to suffer. Would it not lead to their exclusion? In other words, that the poor should be deemed to have waived their fundamental rights to privacy in order to receive benefits and services to which they were legally entitled. This was a constitutional, constitutionally untenable proposition. The dissent, on the other hand, noted that the recorded failures of the Aadhaar-based biometric authentication, ABBA, had resulted in denial of food from ration shops, particularly for the vulnerable groups such as widows, the elderly, and manual workers. It had neither failed to reduce quantity fraud or the problem of missing names in ration cards, the identification of Anto, the poorest to the poor households, or the arbitrary power of private dealers. The dissent noted that the poor internet connectivity was one of the reasons for authentication failures and eventual exclusion. On the crucial aspect of data protection, the majority noted that after they had reserved judgment, the Sri Krishna Commission had submitted its report in July 2018 containing a draft personal data protection bill. The majority hoped that the law would be in place very soon. The dissent noted that the UID number was being seeded into every database. It had become a bridge across discrete data silos, allowing anyone with access to information to reconstruct a profile of an individual's life. Also, prior to the enactment of the Aadhaar Act in 2016, the biometric data of several millions of persons had been collected without their consent and handed over by the UIDAI to L1 Identity Solutions, with which it had a contract for managing such data. L1 Identity Solutions was a foreign entity which specialized in selling face recognition systems, electronic passports, and other biometric technology to the US and Saudi Arabia. In 2011, L1 was acquired by Safran, a French multinational aerospace and defense corporation. The dissent found the willful violation of the court's interim orders by the government to be inexcusable. The harsh truth spoken with clarity in the dissenting judgment was this, and I quote, the linking of the Aadhaar number to different databases is capable of profiling an individual, which could include information regarding her and his race, religion, caste, tribe, ethnicity, language, records of entitlement, income, or medical history. Thus, the impact of technology is such that the scheme of Aadhaar can reduce different constitutional identities into a single identity of a 12-digit number and infringe the right of an individual to identify herself or himself with choice. And yet, ignoring the large tranche of empirical data placed before it, the majority put its seal of approval on an Orwellian dystopia where the people become transparent to the state and not vice versa. The postscript of the Aadhaar judgment was somewhat disillusioning. Although the court held that Section 57 of the Aadhaar Act was unconstitutional, the compulsory linking of bank accounts and mobile numbers with Aadhaar was unlawful, the law was thereafter tweaked to permit such linking as long as there was consent. Likewise, while the court held the collection of biometrics of children to be unlawful, the law was again tweaked to permit it with the consent of parents. That brings me to the central part of this address. What difference has the privacy judgment made to our lives? The privacy judgment belongs to the species of declaratory judgments. Other examples are the right to education judgment, Uni Krishnan, and the Vishaka judgment. These have seemingly longish gestation periods during which they acquire a life of their own and get applied in a variety of contexts. The privacy judgment's recognition of decisional privacy, namely the ability to make intimate decisions primarily consisting of one's sexual or procreative nature, and decisions in respect of intimate relations was invoked to read down Section 377 IPC and decriminalize same-sex relations between consenting adults in a private sphere. Now, Tej Johar. It was used to strike down Section 497 IPC, which punished adultery, to recognize the right of an unmarried woman to medically terminate her pregnancy. 
it formed the main plank of a pil in the delhi high court challenging the validity of section 9 of the hindu marriage act that enables a spouse to seek restitution of conjugal rights in 2022 the supreme court agreed to reconsider its earlier view in jaintilal mistri mandating the disclosure by the reserve bank of india of the names of defaulters of loans doubting if that decision was consistent with the fundamental right to privacy in march 2020 the allahabad high court invoked the right to privacy to invalidate the decision of the lucknow administration to place on the streets banners giving personal details of persons alleged to have indulged in vandalism informational privacy has been invoked recently to plead for a right to be forgotten and to ask for names and other details of persons appearing in reported judgments of courts to be redacted there have been instances however where the response of the judiciary to the attempts to enforce the right have not been encouraging the outcry in 2021 as a result of an investigative report in the new york times that the indian government had procured spyware from the israeli entity pegasus to target the mobile phones of the leader of the opposition journalists and even supreme court judges resulted in pils in which the supreme court appointed a technical committee headed by a former supreme court judge the committee submitted its report to the court in july 2022 but the case has not been taken up since the court has been conflicted in invoking the right to privacy to legalize unions of same sex couples and to accept um, the married women's demand for criminalizing marital rape the privacy judgment has made little difference to the behavior of governments both at the center and the states or even municipal bodies and public sector enterprises undeterred by the botched authentications by the uidi biometric data the problems of errors in data entry compounded by the tortuous procedure in having errors corrected aadhar is insisted upon as the primary identity document not for just availing benefits and services but for a whole range of routine transactions including obtaining a passport or filing a petition in the court with their biometrics routinely failing large sections of the poor and vulnerable are deprived of rations of basic services including shelter schooling and even a hassle free burial or cremation if you are unable to be verified digitally you are invisible to the state to your school to your university to your employer and to private entities you are rendered presenceless the poor and disadvantaged face the prospect of being banished to a digital life outside of which there may be no access to survival rights in india cows and buffaloes too have uids it's called pashu aadhar i'm not joking it's there on the net each of the bovine creatures is expected to have a year tag with a 12 digit uid then there is property aadhar linking aadhar with property details there are mutant and more virulent variations of the uid project in the states examples being andhra pradesh and telangana hospitals store personal medical data with impunity as do shopkeepers and watchmen outside housing societies they routinely ask for your mobile number and many of us willingly part with it if you resist being enrolled in the digi yatra controlled by a private entity your entry into an airport is deliberately made more difficult you pay the price for asserting your right to privacy we live in times where digital stalking and intimidation is common place that the adjectives that aptly describe us are helpless vulnerable gullible surveilled manipulated belying the expectation of the five judge bench that delivered the aadhar judgment even 6 years later the digital personal data protection act is yet to be made operational unfortunately even this statute exempts from its control the government which is the biggest aggregator of personal data then there are reports appearing with fair regularity of large scale data theft data leaks and the ease with which digital big data is sold for being mined by corporate houses or for being crunched by large language models the provisions of the information technology act or even the telecommunications act are inadequate to deal with such contingencies we have known for a while thanks to julian assange and edward snowden the data about us is not in our control it is kept on servers controlled by multinational mega corporations like meta alphabet microsoft amazon 
Apple, and X, earlier Twitter. Each one of these corporations is an American company. Many of them undertake contracts for the Pentagon. Their servers are at remote, inaccessible locations beyond our legal jurisdiction. Our personal data is available not only to our government, but to foreign ones as well. It is no longer a matter of doubt that systems, states, and corporations know more about us than we know ourselves. Thanks to Cambridge Analytica, we now know that big data, algorithms, and artificial intelligence are deployed extensively to manipulate our choices politically and socially, and that we are merely monetizable data points in the larger scheme of international commerce. The drones and satellites hovering above and amidst us have created a glass bubble where we can be seen, but we cannot see those seeing us. Our online presence is being monitored, not just by the state, but by non-state actors and machines unknown to us and located perhaps somewhere in the dark web. There is no silent space in which one can experience true solitude, not in the internet control world. As a 22 year old, I was, fan, I was a fan of the 1983 hit single by Sting. Every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Not anymore. I realize how darkly sinister and prophetic it was. The digital dystopia is here and now. The Black Mirror episodes are sadly not fiction. We are no longer surprised to hear that there was a deep fake recently featuring the digitally morphed speaking image of Elon Musk, or that a mayoral candidate in Cheyenne in Wisconsin vowed, if elected, to run that city exclusively with an AI bot called VIC, Virtually Integrated Citizen. And what was his USP? Your AI would be objective, it wouldn't make mistakes, it would read hundreds of pages of municipal minutiae quickly and understand them. It would, he said, be good for democracy. These days, when I read judgments and lawyers' briefs, I begin to wonder how much of it is a product of chat GPT. <laughs> Ray Kurzweil, an e AI evangelist, in his latest offering, The Singularity is Nearer, prophesizes that by 2029, AI will be better than all humans in every skill possessed by any human. He expects that in the 2030s, solar power enhanced by AI-driven advances in 3D printing will come to dominate the global energy supply. Most consumer goods will be free and there will be a dramatic reduction of physical scarcity, which will finally allow us to easily provide for the needs of everyone. Kurzweil apparently has no problem with allowing the masking of both human mediocrity and ingenuity under an AI-generated veneer of synthetic creativity. It is trite that the internet registers every digital footprint and never forgets. Yet, one wonders whether it is the resignation to the inevitable or sheer ignorance that explains our willingly placing our intimate details in the digital domain in the form of Facebook posts, TikTok videos, Instagram images, or being excited about metaverse and the delusional prospect of assuming different digital persona unmindful of the huge risks that we subject ourselves to. Are we in the throes of a culture of narcissism that American historian Christopher Lash warned us about? We ask for more CCTV and facial recognition devices on roads, public transports and apartments, not knowing who's controlling the data and how. The overload of information on the net is inversely proportional to the knowledge it generates. It has made us compulsive scrollers with dimin diminishing attention spans. In 2019, a remarkable Malayalam film was made. It's still on the st streaming platforms and some of you should see it. It was called Android Kunjapan. An Indian working in Russia sends a robot to his aging father living alone in a remote village to be his AI-controlled virtual assistant. The movie ends with the father being unable to be separated from the android that he has come to depend so heavily on for his emotional sustenance. Six years earlier, in 2013, Hollywood came up with the film Her, 
portraying a man's relationship with his virtual ai assistant personified through a female voice ai promises to resurrect for a renewed interaction digital versions of our loved ones long dead on 14th august this year otv an oriya news channel produced, proudly announced the completion of one year of the launch of india's first ever ai news presenter lisa we seem to be working towards humanizing robots and robotizing humans renowned sociologist sherry turkle wonders what we have become as a result of our interactions with chatbots robots and programs like siri and alexa she explains that talking listening machines are comforting because they shield us from the from encountering friction second guessing ambivalence and the fear of being left behind the assurance of not being judged and being always validated things that usually make interactions with other humans messy and complicated this has led to our expecting more from machines than other humans to quote turkel these machines promise the pleasures of companionship without the demands of friendship the feeling of intimacy without the demand of reciprocity we have become tre- treating programs as people we have enabled the machine to devalue what it is to be human we need to ask ourselves do we want that future what should we then do can we work towards building internet free spaces where we progressively reduce our dependence on machines giving up resisting this overpowering of ourselves by the internet and the machines is not an option the huge effort made by a few amongst us to get a resounding declaration in 2017 from the supreme court of our fundamental right to privacy after a long and hard fought battle should inspire us to emulate it and regain for ourselves and the generations that follow a more secure future a future in which human intelligence will not surrender to ai a future in which we are able to think love eat talk joke pray sing dance act dress and be what we want to be without the looming presence of an omniscient internet and the machine we must work towards a less intrusive state a more empathetic society that veers away from the pretend empathy of the robots as the dissenting judge in the ada judgment reminded us dignity and rights of individuals cannot be based on algorithms or probabilities constitutional guarantees cannot be subject to the vicissitudes of technology thank you thank you very much